restaurant is known for being so packed. Now restaurant workers have been laid off and business has scaled back. In the wake of COVID-19, the entire restaurant industry has struggled. But Chinatown businesses have taken a particularly hard hit. Chinatowns across America are vanishing for reasons that are natural and some that are unnatural. But what can we do about it? Growing up, it felt like Chinatown was the only place that you knew being Chinese was normal. You could count on everyone rooting for Ichiro, Yao Ming, Jin. You could find Gundam, Boba, Cheap Bows, Barbecue, and catch some JDM cars pull up. It was the only place my parents wanted to go out to eat and ping with other adults. So when we started reading that now Chinatowns are shrinking across America, suffering from gentrification, younger generations not taking over businesses, the rise of competing ethno burbs, and now the association with COVID-19, it all struck a chord with us. And I know we aren't the only ones who feel this way. It seems like some change is inevitable, but what's the future hold for Chinatowns in America and even across the globe? And what can you do about it? We're gonna give our thoughts while, of course, trying some of Chinatown's most popular foods. It's been well documented that Chinatowns around the country are shrinking, they're changing. And with the current situation, that whole process has just been accelerated. And since Chinatowns, no matter what city it's in, kind of has a deep place in our hearts, just like many other people, we wanted to explore some important questions about the future of Chinatown. Because if this whole thing is gonna change into something completely new from what we remember as kids, then what is it gonna look like? And who's gonna be involved? And what can you do about it? This is How to Save Chinatown USA. Seattle's Chinatown is different because it's actually an international district that's really pan-Asian. Cantonese from Toysan were the first to arrive in 1850, but there was a lot of different waves that contributed to it being what it is today. Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, and Vietnamese historically, and more recently now, Korean businesses are all in one spot. Of course, they do have their unique differences in language and culture, but they're all friendly enough to share the same real estate and neighborhood. And actually, after traveling to numerous Asian ethnic enclaves across North America, it's clear that not all enclaves are as mixed and pan-Asian as Seattle's International District, and that's something that's very unique and special about it. Chinatown growing up was such an important part of our upbringing in Seattle because there was a time where that was the only zone you felt comfortable being unapologetically Asian. Whether that was being in a traditional foods or more modern stuff like boba or animes or Gundams or just anything. I mean, we were going there to see the rest of the community for certain events. You go there for your comfort food. If you're a kid, you just go there to kind of be around other kids that are like you. And even if you're a parent or an adult, you went there to be able to ping comfortably with other adults from the same culture. I remember growing up, Chinatown was the only place where you would see dad have an incredibly lively back and forth with the waiter and he's recommending this and he's asking if this is fresh or that's fresh. And Look at these gigantic razor clams that they have here. So they cracked them all open for you. You can see where they cracked it open with the knife. So this is Toy Song cauliflower, guys. This is very much for uh, native to the Toy Song region. I, I do understand why it was difficult for my dad to feel that same type of gregarious camaraderie outside of Chinatown. And that's why it was so special. For a lot of parents, it's like the only time that you really got to see their social interactions because at home, they're your hardworking immigrant parents that are often strict, but then in maybe the Asian enclaves, they're like, they're having fun. They're trying dude, to meet people. Dude, they're watching karaoke on the wall. And I mean, Chinatowns are, for most people, a cultural hub, unless you're a tourist and you're from out of town and you're not from the area. But anybody that's familiar with the culture is gonna go there for comfort reasons. You know, you wanna see other people, um, you see familiar faces. It's kind of a way to see other Asian people. Thanks for uh, bringing awareness. 
going into like Chinatown and everything, especially yeah. with all that's going on. Yeah, we're just visiting home for a little bit and we just wanted to do a piece on Chinatowns because they all got hit pretty hard. So yeah. It's a little dead, but people here are amazing. Food's Culture, great. Food's great. Culture's great. How Alright, so Andrew, these are very, very authentic Qingdao dumplings. You know why? Because these are actually sea mackerel. Now, I don't think we've ever shown these on the channel before. These, this is incredibly authentic. I, 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 I buy one and a half. Show the people. Oh man, it's like salty fish. It's Ooh. like salty sea mackerel. So here, in my hand, I have Lu Bao. So Lu is the old name for Shandong. Um, that was a kingdom before China yeah. was united. They were was like separate kingdoms, and sometimes they would war with each other. Yeah, before it was called Shandong, uh, Confucius is from that area, so he's from Lu. Lu. But uh, that was before it was called Shandong. So these are Lu Bao. So these are like a traditional Shandong Baozi. Wow, it's a little Whoa. bit different. It's almost like a Baozi that's wrapped like a dumpling. And uh, notice that it was fried at the bottom to, and all connected. Mm -hmm. This is a very classic northern style too. All right, the, man. Uh, the connected Lu Bao. This is actually my first time having this. I've never had a Lu Bao before, but let's see how it's different. You know what, what the one thing about it that's very Shandong, Andrew? Just gigantic pieces of green onion. Mm. We have the Gortillas. Now in this style, they pour a little bit of this liquid at the end that kind of connects all the dumplings. To my knowledge, I don't see a reason why to do it other than that it maybe adds a little bit of extra texture to it. It almost is like adding some crispies to the whole dish. Uh, they actually call these, uh, Andrew, in Taiwan, they're called Guotie. In mainland China, they're called Jin Zhao. Oh, I'm going in. Andrew, this is a fried mackerel dumpling. See this crust? See this crust that I'm cracking right here? As far as the Qingdao mackerel, Jiaozi, I don't know, man. It, it's like really got a very like pickled fishy flavor because uh, if you guys know mackerel is actually a very controversial piece of sushi too. A lot of people don't like the mackerel nigiri or mackerel sashimi. Um, I kind of do, but I don't like to eat a lot of it. I, it's not bad, but it just wouldn't be my number one pick. That's fair. It probably is not my number one pick either. I'm glad we had it though. But I would say the best thing that we had was the Lu Bao. Song Fang Kong. It says Thai kitchen, but let me tell you this, that has some of the best Lao food I've had. I'm going there. I'm going there after this. Yo, I remember when this spot first opened and it was just like ran by. Well, they didn't even have a cash register. They didn't have a cash register. They just had a box full of cash. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Do you want a napkin or a plastic box? No, it's okay. okay. It's good. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Real quick, I gotta give a shout out to Mushashi's. I mean, this is some of the best cheap sushi that you can get anywhere. And this is what Seattle's known for, okay? A reason why a lot of the cheap sushi in Seattle is so good is a lot of the same reason why salmon is so good in Washington too. They're getting it straight from Alaska or straight from around the waters of Washington. A lot of people say that the sushi in Seattle is very affordable, but still very good. Most compared people. to other places. Yeah. So why why is it so affordable and good? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How's business? Ah, uh, so slow, no good. Yeah, because of the corona, no people in the outside. Yeah, yeah. The older generations were definitely not optimistic that their business was going to be around in another five or ten years. And um, I do think that's sad because their businesses are a part of history and have served so many different people through multi generations. However, I do think that the whole purpose of Chinatowns was not to just stay the same forever. 
This intersection is really special because you have a Japanese supermarket, you have Taiwanese boba, you have Korean desserts, you have Korean food, and then you have two Cantonese spots, the barbecue and the bakery side, and then you have Shanghainese, and then at this corner you have a mainland Chinese hot pot chain. Just at this intersection, David, it's kind of a really good representation of what is here in International District. And I do think that it is maybe, if it's possible, a good direction for other Chinatowns to follow. Another thing that is happening across the country is that non-Asian businesses are moving into Chinatown, but they're usually pretty modern and they cater to sort of like a hip millennial audience that does want to eat authentic Asian food, but also get a hipster burger. I do think that the reason it's worth covering this place and giving this spot a review is because this is actually the way Chinatowns are changing. But it is for an open-minded audience that doesn't mind their burgers being served right next to dumplings. I think that the inclusion of non-Asian businesses into Chinatowns was controversial, but I think at this point in 2020, it feels like something necessary to keep them alive. Andrew, it is true that traditionally, most Chinatowns in America, if not all of them, were primarily founded by people from Taishan, AKA Toysan, China. Andrew, what do you think about there only being one Toysan business on this main street? Theoretically, the group that stands the most to lose are the originators of Chinatown, which are Toysan people, because that means their business was, will increasingly make up a smaller percentage of what's available. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that that's kind of how life goes. I do think a lot of Toysan people who started in Chinatown made a good living and then moved out to the suburbs. That's often the story for a lot of people who start in in the urban Chinese enclave. I don't think 100% of businesses in Chinatown should be Chinese necessarily. I think they should all have a mix, but they should have all Chinese represented in Chinatown. Because as you say, it's in the name, Chinatown. I think that Chinese culture overall is expanding. I think Chinese food is as popular as it's ever been. Uh, restaurants are still popping up everywhere, but the specific Southern Chinese culture, particularly the Cantonese Hakka, Toy San, and Chiu Jiao styles will make up a smaller percentage moving forward. But I think the staples will always be there. I think um, the organizations, line dance teams, family associations will still be around, um, but it just won't be the main representation of Chinese culture moving forward. I think if Chinatowns want to adapt to be a little bit more pan-Asian and essentially Asian towns, I think that's going to be a better chance. It's going to appeal to a wider audience. I think if the second or third generation Cantonese or Southern Chinese, you know, want that history to continue, then I hope some of them can build teams and support, uh, whether that's you know, always spend their money in Chinatown or open up dessert spots, fusion spots, traditional Chinatown foods. Um, we've seen it with some friends in New York. They try to open up modern Asian dessert spots, which I still think really help, even if it's not particularly Cantonese. Or even barbershops. I think the natural chain of events to move more into the suburbs since it's nicer and more pleasant, easy living than the urban city life is inevitable and that's gonna happen more and more. But I think Chinatowns will always hold a special place because they're gonna be in the city centers. And I do not think, although Chinatowns are shrinking, I don't think they're going away. I think they're just changing. Chinatowns sort of live within you. If you really think about Chinatowns, they were designed to represent or be an enclave for um, a different community within the city. And you can actually bring that with you wherever you go. China's sort of the big mother Asian country that has had uh, a very, very big cultural influence all around Asia. David, I just realized our YouTube channel, the food portion, is like Chinatown. You mean Chinatown, where, Seattle. Where it's mostly Chinese, but actually all different Asians are represented. I'm an official tea farmer. We're at McAllister Lane in downtown Penang. They really pull it straight live out of the water. You can touch it, you can hold it. We are outside of the largest wholesale fish and seafood market in the entire world. President Obama did grow up in Jakarta for two years of his life. He went to this school right here, and now this nasi goreng cart is right outside. I think some of the bigger stores that have been around for decades might be able to stick around for a little bit longer, but I do know, and I got the sentiment from some of the smaller shop owners that had been running their shop in a certain way for about 30 years, they don't feel like they're really gonna be able to adapt. They don't have that, their business doesn't have that much more time left. So you're done, okay?
What do you recommend? I, I want to get all the, the kiwi and the green tea and the oolong probably. We've been here for almost 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we started back uh, in Wajamaya back in 01, all but done. then we integrated here. Uh, what's cool about the, we don't focus too much on the ice cream, but it's privately made for us. Oh yeah? Yeah, so okay. you won't find it anywhere else, man. Hello, Hello. Joe. Nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> it's a cool spot how it's like, you know, yeah. uh, Taiwanese tea shop and then it has ice cream here. That's so cool. I heard the oolong is the yi ming. Mm. Seattle best tea. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Okay. Thank you. Seattle best. Very Taiwanese. The oolong is actually really, really strong. That's got to be the strongest oolong ice cream I've ever had. And she did say, young people work hard even during Corona. I guess there's a similarity, David. No matter even if you're a young ABC or a shop owner in Chinatown, the work never stops. I think that more Asian Americans and specifically Asian Americans that are Chinese American need to look at the responsibility or the opportunity of operating family business with bright eyes because actually you can flip it and make even more money than you would have in corporate America. I could totally see David 20, 25 years ago taking over a family business in Chinatown sounded a lot more unappealing than it is now especially with social media and you see this whole wave of Asian chefs and you kind of get credit for keeping the culture alive. I think it can be really fun. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be hard, but it could be really cool. Steve Bun and Steve Bun. Okay, cool. Thank you. But what I would say is that speaking to the younger shop owners, they feel a little bit more confident because they're from the younger generation. They know how to adapt and update their products. You guys know that we are pretty heavy in the 626 when it comes to boba. But this is actually one of the first places I ever got boba in my entire life. Right, it's here at Oasis in Seattle's Chinatown. Now, are they doing boba on the same Probably level as like a, all the cheese foam and all the fancy stuff uh, that they're doing in LA? Not always, but they got the classics here and they do them solid. It's a classic shot. Hey, how many times have you seen that? This boba was super good at Oasis. Yo, I don't think Oasis always tasted like this. Mix it in with the rest of my drink. Andrew, in front of us, we have something representing the old school, native to any Chinatown in America or Canada, Cha Siu. Yo, the five spice is really strong and kicks. Mm. I like it. That's sauce? They spice it authentically. They don't care. They're not, they're not toning it down for people. Chinese au jus, you know, the Chinese soup sauce that they put on top of it. The tup, so good here. So here we have uh, old school Cantonese barbecued meats. And then here we kind of have this fusion between Taiwanese popcorn chicken and the Hong Kong egg waffle. All right guys, this is popcorn chicken from Oasis. This is actually the first popcorn chicken I ever had in my life. Mm. So Andrew, it seems like Oasis has really been able to update itself. It was sort of like the lollipop or the tapioca express. But whereas in California, Tapioca Express and Lollipop have kind of fallen behind in terms of innovation. What do you think it is? Do you think it's the lack of competition that's allowed Oasis to kind of like, you know, still be the top dog? I think overall, they've done a good job of keeping the quality up, keeping the vibes up. Obviously, as you can tell, it's not the fanciest spot. It's not as fancy as some of these spots in New York and LA, but it doesn't have to be. Andrew, you were talking to the butcher at King's and he said that he really doubted that it would still be around in about 15 years. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Either they'll sell it or they'll shut it down. And some places in other cities, I know in Vancouver, Canada, they have a famous chashu spot that I think they're gonna keep try to keep open for another 100 years. However, certain spots like King's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It had its time. You know, obviously their grandkids, if they wanted to, would have an opportunity to completely revamp, refresh, redo everything and make it sort of a modern brand but I don't think that a lot of second or third generation kids want that responsibility. I think there will always be barbecue spots in Chinatown, but I don't think every single one that's open right now will stay open. Obviously, nobody knows which business will be around five years from now, 10 years from now, but while they're still here, enjoy while it lasts. Right now in the Asian food world is the Korean elevated corn dog. Woo! But this is not a corn dog, David. This is a Korean rice hot dog, meaning that it's probably going to have a slightly crispy and chewy outer skin made out of rice. Oh, 
Andrew, speaking to the pan-Asian nature of Seattle's Chinatown International District, we've got the trendiest, the Korean hot dog, Chung Chun. Here you have the half mozzarella, half hot dog. You have the squid ink hot dog. Here you have a mozzarella potato. You have the ramen hot dog. And then you have a sweet mozzarella sweet potato with sugar on top. All right, here we go, you guys. This is actually our first time having this. One thing, Andrew, when we were in Seoul, Korea, I noticed that they take a lot of American things and then they put their own twist on it. Yeah. Like a lot of army food. All right, these are the Chung Chun rice hot dogs. Smash that like button if you guys are enjoying this video so far. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and turn on your notifications. Shout out to that cheese pool. Mmm. So far, personally, if I'm eating something like this, I do want there to be a hot dog on it. Um, it's easier to eat as well. Mmm. You know what? Let me sauce these up for John because I think John's gonna have to try these. John, have you ever had these before? I don't never had these for before. Man. There you go. You get some hot. You missed <laughs> the hot dog. One word, John. That's a squid ink. Way better than a corn dog. I mean, I would eat this. I would pay a 50% premium to eat this for sure. At the end of the day, I do think change is inevitable, but it's just about you know how we acknowledge that and move forward from it to accomplish our own goals. I don't think Chinatowns need to be the only bastion of Chinese culture anymore. It should appeal to a wider audience, showing how Chinese culture has spread over to different places and, and even how Chinese culture has adapted over the years. I think it's still okay. Every Chinatown has like museums and you know, the old school businesses, but overall, there is gonna be a big change coming. Now, Andrew, the ethno burbs will always be the burbs. Hey, there's something to be said about Asians having their own part in the city center. So hopefully in this video, it's able to educate or inspire those who also care about Chinatown. I know that there's a lot of other organizations that are kind of like under the umbrella of Save Chinatown and Preserve Chinatown. Maybe we'll leave some links down below, um, but you know, do what you can. And if you care, you'll do something. So how can you save Chinatown? Well, you can spend your money there, start new businesses that attract the younger generations, and get involved in community organizations. But regardless of what happens, you're either paying homage to the old days, getting involved in the new days, or better yet, both. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching that video. And in the comments down below, number one, please let us know what your favorite Chinatown, Asia Town, Asian enclave is that you visited or that you currently live in. Also, let us know in the comments down below what you think the future of Chinatowns are. Um, this is a question that we explored throughout this whole video. And, and, you know, it's just really interesting. And like we said, it's something that a lot of people care about. So please let us know in the comments down below. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, we out. Peace. Peace. Dude, I, I didn't know that we would ever get this many Kit Kats, to be honest. Yo, came up, man. I'm super excited. We gotta get a car.